Here are 10 questions that I feel an atheist needs to answer. Question number one. If there is no God, why is there anything at all? Was the universe devoid of all matter and then the matter suddenly, somehow created? How did that happen? In many cultures, the customary answer is that a god or gods created the universe out of nothing. But if we wish to pursue this question courageously, we must, of course, ask the next question. Where did God come from? If we decide that this is an unanswerable question, why not save a step and conclude that the origin of the universe is an unanswerable question? Or, if we say that God always existed, why not save a step and conclude that the universe always existed, that there's no need for a creation, it was always here. These are not easy questions. Cosmology brings us face to face with the deepest mysteries, with questions that were once treated only in religion and myth. Okay. By the way, don't bother with the where did God come from argument. God, by definition, is self-existent and Second question, where is the evidence that life could have begun without intelligent interference? So what do scientists believe about the origin of life? Let's take this step by step. The first step involves looking at the primordial Earth 4.7 billion years ago. There it is, mostly wet, very warm, and with an atmosphere composed of all sorts of gases hydrogen, hydrogen cyanide, methane and ammonia among them. DNA is a long chain molecule made from just four different types of nucleotide. So the first question is, where did the nucleotides come from? No, there's no need to imagine God sprinkled them on the earth. They can form quite happily on their own. In 1961, hydrogen cyanide and ammonia were left to stew in an aqueous solution in a laboratory under conditions very similar to the primordial earth. Left alone, the solution produced adenine, one of the four nucleotides that make up DNA. Once nucleotides formed, the next step was to join together to make chains called polynucleotides. In the 1980s, researchers found that a clay called montmorillonite, which was abundant on the primordial sea floor and in hot pools of water on land, is the perfect catalyst for this process. Some of these long polynucleotide chains, like ribonucleic acid, or RNA, are able to make copies of themselves. The copies aren't always perfect. Mistakes creep in. But some imperfectly copied molecules would have been better adapted to the environment than others. These successful molecules continued to replicate and pass on their traits, while weaker or less well-adapted molecules would have broken apart. Over hundreds of millions of years, RNA grew more complex, the single strand became a double strand and the better adapted DNA molecule evolved. One of the differences between RNA and DNA is that DNA needs proteins to replicate itself. Proteins are made of amino acids, which are often called the building blocks of life. So where did the first ones come from? No, there was no need for God. The same experiment that produced nucleotides from a primordial broth of ammonia and hydrogen cyanide also produced a lot of amino acids and long chains of amino acids called polypeptides. Montmorillonite, it turns out, is a natural breeding ground for all kinds of complex organic chemicals. As DNA molecules replicated themselves, they shared their environment with other chemicals that thrive in Montmorillonite clay. One group, called lipids, have a natural tendency to clump together to form spherical structures called micelles. RNA or DNA molecules that attracted these lipids would therefore find themselves protected inside a micelle membrane. Because they were better protected, they better survived and replicated more successfully. There you have the first primitive cells. They look nothing like the complex cells we have today for a very good reason. Over 3.7 billion years, they've evolved. I'll tackle the subject of evolution in another video. 
What you've seen in this video is a chemical process that took us from non-living chemicals to primitive cells in around one billion years. It has to be said that this research is in its infancy and current hypotheses are nowhere near as solid as the theory of evolution, which has been around for 150 years and has overwhelming evidence to support it. Question three, how can evolution explain features of irreducible complexity apart from intelligent intervention? What I'm talking about is um, features that we see in creatures today, such as wings. Creationists are also very fond of wings. And they, uh, once again, make a similar point about what's the good of half a wing, what's the good of three quarters of a wing. How could something like those wings have evolved from the silly little wing stubs that must have been there at the beginning of the evolution of wings. Well, let's tackle this with another little Bryson special. These are not exactly flying creatures. They live up trees and they have wings to show they're creatures. They also have little eyes to show that they're creatures. Uh, they live up trees and if they were to fall from the trees they would uh, have been at, in, at risk of breaking their necks. Thank you. Both of them, in this case, uh, from this low height, one with a little skirt and without a little skirt, uh, survive the, the, the breakage. At this depth, you don't need a little wing. This is a wing stub, call it a flange or a wing stub. It's not become a wing, but we're looking at the ancestral uh, stub that might eventually have evolved into a wing. When the height is sufficiently low, then nobody's going to break their neck. But if we raise the thing a bit, very carefully, sometimes these animals are going to find themselves leaping from higher branches. And at, from higher branches, it may be that these little, even pathetic little wing stubs like this might make a difference. Let's see what happens now. Right. Now, in this case, from that higher level... From that higher level, even a little wing stub like this can make a difference. And once you've got the evolution of a wing stub this long, then natural selection may favor the, the wing stub getting a bit longer still because there's going to be an even higher height that you could fall from where the difference between a wing stub that high and between a wing stub that high might make a difference. And the point is that we have a smooth gradient all the way up higher and higher heights that you could fall from to drive the lineage, to drive the species towards ever longer wings. Um, question four. How can the evolutionary model be true since the fossil record clearly shows most major groups emerging at the same time? I'd like you to Google uh, Cambrian explosion and see what I'm talking about there. Most of the major animal forms appear in the form that they currently have in the present. Oh, really? Most of the major animal forms appear in the form that they currently have in the present. And this is from a man who has two PhDs, one in molecular and cell biology from Berkeley and the other in religious studies from Yale. You see, the snappy answer you will usually get from an evolutionary biologist when asking him what would convince him that evolution is wrong is fossil bunnies in the Cambrian. So, Wells, if in the Cambrian explosion most of the major animal forms appear in the form they currently have in the present, where are the Cambrian fossils of bunnies, whales, bayan trees, chameleons, ants, turkeys, kangaroos, orchids, crocodiles, lions, elephants, bees, humans, spiders, etc., etc., etc.? What the senior fellow of the creationist organization, the Discovery Institute, is willfully ignoring is that every single creature from the Cambrian explosion was water-dwelling. The invasion of land happened about 100 million years after the Cambrian explosion. 